We're in the message series, Mission Impossible. Forgive me, I'm going through a little congestion, so that's why I sound a little weird this morning. Uh, but we've been trying to answer this question throughout the series. This is the main question that we've been looking at, the main thought here. It says this, how do we stand firm in our faith, and I say faith, while living in an ungodly culture, and at the same time lead, some I say lead, lead in such a way that we're able to influence the culture towards Christ. We've been dissecting this, and Pastor Jermaine brought a great, powerful message just a couple of weeks ago uh, on chapter 5 of Daniel, of the writing on the wall. If you haven't seen it or you missed it, you need to go watch that message. Powerful message. Thank you, Jermaine, for that awesome message. And we're going to dive in this morning to, to chapter 6 and try to, try to I'm really going to park on leading. Because, you know, we've talked a lot in this series about the culture, but I really want to focus on, and I believe the prophecy that we're going to look in the rest of Daniel is about how we should lead in these, in these last days. Today in Daniel 6, it's known, many people, if you grew up in Sunday school or grew up in church, you know the story of the lion's den. We're not actually going to focus on that because I think, I think we miss some things by focusing on the lion's den in the earlier part of the chapter. And so, we're talking about this whole thing of living and leading a godly, even an ungodly culture. And here's what's interesting to me. Daniel in chapter 6, historians tell us that he was about 90 years old at this time. Now, my felt board when I was growing up made him look like a young man, all right? But, uh, but history tells us something different. He's about 90 years old. I don't know how many 90-year-olds we have in the church, but I do... Th- feel like and believe, before we read this and look at this, that we need to remember that Daniel, at 90 years old now, has served three kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and now a new empire has taken over. Babylon is no more, it's Medo-Persia, and it is uh, the king, King Darius, and he's the third king at 90 years old, and here's the interesting thing that the Lord showed me is Daniel's 90 years old and God ain't done with him. He's 90 years old, and God has him right where he wants to be. And I've got a question for anybody that's 65 and older in this room, or if you're watching us today. Why do we start, I wrote this in my journal this week, why do we start disqualifying ourselves as we get older? Why is it that we disqualify ourselves as we get older? Is, is God gotten older? No. We've gotten older, so we begin to limit ourselves. We begin to disqualify ourselves, say, I can't do that. Now, there are physical things that maybe you and I can't do as we age, but the fact of the matter is we still serve a miracle-working God at 75 like we did when we were 15. God does not change. And I submit to anyone that is 65 years or older in this room or watching us online that God is not through with you yet. God isn't thrown in the towel. If you woke up this morning with breath in your lungs, there's something that God wants you to do. I submit to you, you're right where God wants you. God wants to use you no matter how young or old you are. I, you know, honestly, I think a lot of people, I looked it up, a lot of people with old age, they consider it decline. Can I submit to you the thought that that is wrong thinking? Or as we say in the South, that is stinking thinking. That is wrong. It is not, we should not, because here, the facts are the facts, that people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s have done incredible, have brought incredible contributions to society, incredible accomplishments in those age groups. I'm thinking of Grandma Moses, the great rural painter, 80 years old, started painting. Thomas Edison was inventing at 90 years old. That mind was still creating through the, through the Lord. George Bernard Shaw was writing plays at 90. J.C. Penney, the great Christian, was working strenuously at his desk at 95 years old. I could go on and go on. Who was the lady just recently in the news? At 77 years old, she was diagnosed with cancer. Now, at 87 years old, just this past year, she's cancer-free, and she ran. She came in 18th place in a 40-mile marathon, an 87-year-old woman. Christian or not, I'm telling you, age is just a number. It's just a number. We put the mentality block that I can't do because I'm getting older, or what will people think? I just want to encourage you. Daniel was 90 years old. And God still was not done with him. 
And as we're about to read in these verses, that we're going to see that God did something great through him at 90 years old. There's that one verse that is really funny. You don't need to turn there because we're living in Daniel 6, but this is one of my, my, my funny verses in, jo- in the Bible. Joshua 13.1 says this. Look on your screen here. When Joshua was old, somebody say old, and well advanced in years, you thought the Lord would say something really sweet and encouraging to him. The Lord said to him, you are very old. And this, but he didn't stop there. And there are still large areas of land to be conquered. Think about that. Joshua, you are very old, but it didn't end there. And there are still, somebody say still, there are still large areas of land to be conquered. There's more to do. There's more ground to be taken. So let's read here, Daniel chapter 6, are you there? I want to give you context of where Daniel was at in life before we read this. Here we go, verse 1. Darius the Mede, he's the king, decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. So he's got 120 guys uh, over each province. The king also chose, oh, here he comes, Daniel and two other officers as administrators, or maybe your translation says governors, to supervise the 120 high officers and to protect the king's interest. Verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. What influence. Now, I want to read you the next verse, the same verse I just read, but I want to read it out of the New King James. Look what it says right here on your screen. Then this Daniel, and can you say the next two words with me? Come on, church. Distinguished himself proved himself, New Living says, more capable. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, that's the 120 officers, because, say it with me, an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought, hey, I'm going to put this guy over the whole kingdom. Because an excellent spirit was in him. I've always heard that priest, it was on him. Actually, every translation I looked up, it was in him. That means it was inside. It was the core of who he was. Look at verse 4. Then the other administrators and the high officers begin. Oh, this is what jealousy always does. Then the other high administrators and high officers begin searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. They were looking to see if they could find a flaw in his leadership. Look at this. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. Now, by the way, being critical and condemning, that shouldn't be a part of the people of God anyway, but these people weren't the people of God. And they're looking, they're looking for some way they can find the way that Daniel's leading. Oh, he's doing this. Oh, no. He, he's, no. They couldn't find anything. Look at this. Next, next sentence. He was faithful. All, speaking of Daniel, he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Man, can we say that together? He was what? Faithful, always, and completely. He was what? He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. And I submit to you that's because he had an excellent spirit within him. Those followed the spirit that was in his heart and the conviction of what he believed. So they, the men that were trying to find fault with him, so they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. And I believe that's the day we're coming to with this culture today. There is so much packed in these five verses. We're going to keep reading in just a moment, but I want to just pause and look at this for a second. It says, then this Daniel distinguished himself. I looked up distinguished. Look at this on the definition right here. Distinguished means this, to recognize someone or something as different. Somebody say different. You ever, you, ever looked at, you ever looked at somebody and just like, they're just, they're different. I'm not talking about in a bad way. I mean, we could all be like, yeah, they're just a little too different. But, but there was something different about that, that coworker, that, that neighbor, that, that person, that friend. There was something different. They, they, they were set apart. They were distinguished. They recognize, look what it means, recognize someone or something is different. Make oneself prominent and worthy of respect through one's behavior or achievements. 
Well, well what was it that set Daniel apart? I've, ar- I've already said it, but I want to highlight this if I can. It was the excellent spirit that was in him. Now, again, I've heard it taught before. I, I do, I wanted to just point out, every word in the Bible is there on purpose. I've heard it taught many years about excellence that it's on people. I submit to you that if it's just on people, then it can fall off people. But if it's inside your DNA, if it's burned in your heart, I'm going to be a man of excellence before the Lord. I'm going to work my job off for the glory. I'm going to work everything I can for the glory of my king. I'm not doing it for a raise. I, it, that, that, you know what that is? That's a byproduct of the excellence. I, I'm not going to do it for recognition of man. I'm, whatever I'm given, I'm going to do it with all my heart before the Lord. And let's get a lot more personal. Men, I'm going to be an excellent husband. I'm going to be an excellent father. Don't hear perfect because there's no such thing. Don't confuse excellence with perfectionism. Perfectionism can never be achieved. All right? But we can be people of excellence. Amen? And it's got to be burned in our heart, part of our conviction. It was Daniel's conviction. It was what distinguished him. I don't know what those 120 people were doing, and I don't know what those other two leaders were doing, but Daniel's excellence distinguished him above everybody else, so much so that Darius thought to himself, I'm going to make him ruler over it all. And I'm telling you, that, brothers and sisters, brings great influence. I believe most bosses today are begging, even if they're not a believer, begging God, could you give me some excellent workers? I hear from a lot of people, they can't keep their workers. Could you give me just a few employees that would work with excellence? And I'm telling you, I think a lot of times we get caught in the trap of society. Well, you haven't done anything for me, so I'm not going to really work hard for you. Brothers and sisters, that's not right. Because I'm not working for you, I'm working for him. And I work unto him, so I give him my very best. My very best. The very best that I can give, I'm going to give it to him. Because I'm doing it for him. I may get a paycheck with a such, such and such written on there to my name, but really all of it comes from him. I live for him. I work unto him. Everything I do is for him. Amen? Let me, let me give you a Chris Frith definition of excellence because there's a bunch out there. I tried to simplify this. It's basically this. It's doing the very best with what you have. It's to do better. Or surpass. You know what? Our church may not have MTV's budget. Our church may not have this budget or these people's budget or this big company. But you know what? We can do the very best with what we have in Jesus' name. You may not, don't ever compare yourself to your neighbors or to other people or coworkers. Just do the very best with what you have. Look at this. It's doing the very best with what you have. You may feel limited. Well, do your very best with the limitations that you have. Do better. Surpass. I asked our staff, as I'm asking myself, what can we surpass in 19 that maybe we didn't do excellent to the Lord in 18? And it starts with me. How can I grow? How can I do better? Not perfectionism. I just want to grow. I want to do better for the glory of my king to do better or to surpass. It's the state or quality of doing things exceptionally exceptionally well. Listen, let me just tell us to, tell us to you, I, most, most of us get this, Excellence is not a spiritual gift. It, it, it's not. It's not there with prophecy. It's not a spiritual gift. Excellence, every one of us in this room, no matter how young or old you are, you and I can walk in excellence. If you're home today with your nice hot coffee, sitting on your couch watching this service, in your robe, <laughs> while we're here in the glory of the Lord, No matter where you're at, no matter how old you are, how young you are, listen to me, we can walk in a spirit of excellence, but it starts inside. And then it flushes flushes itself outside. You know what excellence is? I've learned this the hard way. Excellence is just making a decision. I'm going to wake up today and everything I do today, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow, everything I do today, I'm going to do the very best I can for the king. Well, I don't have a boss that respects me. They treat me wrong. I haven't gotten a raise in this long. I'm telling you, do it unto the king and watch God bless you. And you know what? If the boss won't recognize you, God will recognize you and bless you anyway when you have the heart that's in the right place. 
You don't do it to get, you do it to honor. I want to say that again. Very simple language, a little Bama language there. Don't do it to get, do everything to honor. Excellence. Somebody say excellence. Daniel had this excellent spirit in him going all the way back to chapter 1. Because he had an excellent relationship with God. That's where excellence starts, with our relationship with God. Every one of us in this room and those who are watching today, God, the great creator. Genesis 131 says this, one of my favorite verses about excellence. God says when he looked, everything was created. He said he looked at all that was created and he saw that it was excellent in every way. And he said that right before he rested. So the great creator who came up with excellence has put that capacity of excellence in us. No matter how old or young you are. I've seen some young people that walk in a spirit of excellence that will blow your mind. I've seen some older people that walk in a spirit of excellence that will blow your socks off. Things they've done with the spirit of excellence. Doing the very best with what you have unto the glory of the King. A verse, Colossians 3 says this, look at this, and whatever you do on the screen, do it heartily or wholeheartedly as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Somebody say excellence. But, he, but here's the thing, that we're going to pick back up in verse 6. Here's the thing about excellence. Listen to me, church. When you choose to be a man or woman of excellence, there are two choices of the people around you. You will either uh, encourage people around you to raise the bar in their own life, and they will choose the road of excellence, or the people around you will say, I'm fine with just good enough, and you're making me look bad, so I'm going to make you look bad. Jealousy always curses. It never blesses. Jealousy always lies. Jealousy always speaks negative. Jealousy is, it, the Bible literally tells it's, it's part of evil. Every form of evil, there's jealousy. That's strong. That's James, by the way. He says, where there's every form of, of, of evil, you will find jealousy. He tells us that. Whether we like to hear that or not. So if there's jealousy in me, oh God, get rid of it. You know what? The opposite of jealousy is, is celebrating our brothers and sisters. Celebrating our co-workers. If they get a raise, man, praise God, that's awesome. If they're not a Christian, that's okay. Praise God, you got a raise, that's awesome. You've been working your tail off. Good job. Man, you're doing a great job. You're celebrating people instead of like, that should have been me. That should have been me. I've noticed an entitlement, no matter how old or young you are. Oh, they struggle with excellence. Because they think they deserve something. I deserve this. You, I deserve this. Control. I want whatever it is. And I'm telling you, we don't need to have any entitlement in us. We need to have all of excellence in us. Amen? And that's what Daniel was walking in. In these verses right here. Look at it together at verse 6. So here's what jealousy does. I'm giving you that picture of right here what the scriptures tell us. So the administrators, verse 6, and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. That's not true. Daniel wasn't there. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, look, they've gotten everybody together. That the king should make a law that, there, that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. Look at this, verse 8. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius, because who wouldn't want to be worshipped for 30 days, signed the law. Can you imagine? They were all like, they were just, you know, they were buttering him up. Oh, King Darius, oh, majesty. You know, they were just, King Darius, King Darius, your majesty. What if we just came up with this law? We have all agreed together. Daniel was never in the conversation. They weren't even doing it for the king. They had no honor for the king. They were doing this to get rid of Daniel. You'll find that's what jealousy will do. Insecurity, that's, that's what envy will do. It will even come to the point that it will try to hurt you. The Bible tells us to even bless those who try to hurt us or, or, or persecute us. But there's Daniel, not in this conversation. They go to the king and, hey, king, 30 days. They can't worship anybody. Can't pray to anybody but you. Oh, Darius, oh, Darius, for 30 days. And Darius, he's like, well, that sounds great. And he signs the law. Look at it right here. Verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, I love this. Here's the excellence on him. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home 
and knelt down as, say it with me, usual in, the up, in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. Now look at this. He prayed three times a day just as he has always done, giving thanks to his God. Excellence always starts in private. Then the officials, verse 11, went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. Look at that. So they're spying on him. And Daniel's up there just praying, doing his thing like he does every day, praying. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about the law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Look at this. The king replied, well, yes, that decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. They just trapped him. Then they told the king, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Now, look at this. This shows you the respect and honor that a king had for Daniel. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. Well, the men, other men saw this, and look at verse 15. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know, they're reminding him, you know that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. Verse 16, so at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And look at this. Then the king said to him, look at these words right here. May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. That's from a heathen king. Church, leave that on there if you don't mind for just a second. Church, I want to submit to you, most of you in this room, most of you watching, you don't work for the church. You get your check from somewhere else, whether it's your own company or a company you work for. And you're surrounded all day long with people that may know the Lord or may not know the Lord. That's why I try to get out of this office as much as I can. I'll, I'll do study at Starbucks. Different. I want to be around people all the time. But I want to I encourage you in something. I believe this tells us, point blank, that people can see your faith. People can see, your faith's got to have feet, not just talk. That there's got to be a, yes, a walk to your faith. That the people, a king, a heathen king, Saul, I believe that Darius deep inside wanted what Daniel had. We'll see that in just a moment before we close out. He said, may your God, whom you serve, you are so faithful. Whom you serve so faithfully, may he rescue you. Strength on display, that's right, babe. People seeing God through your life. People hearing God at work. Church people, listen to me. Don't get caught up in just the church world. There is a lost and dying world, and the best Jesus that they can see is in you. They can see Jesus and hear Jesus in you and me. Wherever we're at, may they, may they see, may Jesus be on exhibit through our lives. And I submit to you, that is the difference. That is what makes us extraordinary. It is the Jesus in me. It is the Jesus in you. That's what, that's the difference. And that's what Darius saw. So let's look at this together before we close out. Look at verse 17. Darius is, and th this shows you something right here about Darius. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone. So they've thrown Daniel in. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seal of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace. Look at this. <laughs> then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. Now, we don't know if he was praying and fasting. Fasting doesn't have to be prayer included. But he spent the night fasting, and we know this because it says he refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. I'm telling you, Daniel had made a mark on Darius. Church, you can live your life in such a way that you make a mark on people. That people are touched by your life. That they're encouraged. You know, there, there was a young man in my high school. His name was Chandler. I may have told the story before, so forgive me. But for those who haven't heard it, his name was Chandler. But the entire school, we were a 6A school, knew him as Mr. Happy. 
all right? And he was always happy. He was always joyful. That young man, a good friend of mine, led more people to the Lord in the four years with him in high school. He was so full of joy. He was always happy that literally the jocks, the cheerleaders, the, I mean, he, he didn't play games. He wasn't in the drama. He didn't date. He was just a man that loved God, and he just had this, this ideology inside of him. I'm going to be a blessing to every single person I come in contact with. They just recently visited our home, came by. They were coming through, Iowa, uh, coming through Omaha. And, 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 you know, and I told his kids, I said, kids, you're, I said, I didn't live for God. I was a fake Christian. But I said, your dad, they're young kids. I said, but your dad had more respect than anybody in our school because he really lived it. I'm telling you, when you live it for God, you don't have to fake it till you make it. It's just in you. It comes out of you. Whatever's in you is going to come out of you, no matter what. And so Darius has seen this. He's refused his usual entertainment, couldn't sleep at all that night. Now look at this. Very early that next morning, when the sun was coming up, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. Now, by the way, do you, do you think that when you threw people, lion's den was a normal thing back then, you know, just uh, throw them to the lions, and, and you didn't hear from them again. Why in the world would the king get up and go to the lion's den? I mean, could he have possibly thought in his mind, could this God rescue this Daniel? I believe he did. And what other reason would he go to the, to the lion's den? I, I just want to see the leftovers. No, I mean, why, why, why did he go? He went because, look what he says right here. He says this. Very early in the morning, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he got there, look at this. He called out in anguish. Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? I believe there wasn't even a pause. There wasn't even just a moment of silence. I believe Daniel immediately responded. David, Daniel answered, long live the king. Look at the honor coming from Daniel's mouth. May God, my God send his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight. And look at this. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. That's coming from a place of honor. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Now look at this. Much like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fire where there was not, they were, their hair wasn't even singed, not a scratch was found on Daniel, for he had trusted in his God. In the last, two, last verse, Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Brutal. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart, which would be normal when you throw meat to lions, before they even hit the floor of the den. Church, in this last few moments, I just want to tell you, we've got to be a people of excellence. And it's, and it's not the thing that is on us, it's the thing that is in us. It's, it's a choice. It's a decision. I submit to you, it's an attitude. It's an attitude. I'm going to do it unto the Lord. Now, we're speaking in the context of Christianity here, but I do know unbelievers that live excellence, that they do it with excellence. Excellence is not just a Christian thing. It is a God thing. It comes from the great creator. But excellence, when it's on display, everyone knows it. But I believe when we live a life of excellence before the Lord, God touches it and he honors it and he blesses it. Amen? And church, it starts with our hearts. It starts in our relationship with the Lord. As, as 19 is knocking at the door, I can't believe it, 2019, it's going to be really weird when I write the words 2020. That's just going to be weird. Because I watched movies <laughs> when I was a kid about 2020. <laughs> but here's the deal. As we look at 19, and, and whether we like it or not, 19 is coming. We look over 18. I, su- I, su- I submit this to you as, I, as the Lord is just checking me on it. Where are areas of my life that I've allowed mediocrity? Half-heartedness. To him. 
where, where have I allowed things maybe to get a little lukewarm? Can I just tell you, good is not good enough. There's great. There's greatness with our God. We serve a great God, and He wants to do great things in us. And no matter where you're at today in this room or, or watching us online, God, just like He used Daniel, who had a conviction. It was, you know what it was? It was a conviction of excellence. It would not be changed. You saw it from his young life at 16 all the way to 90. Daniel didn't last much longer after this part, passage of time. But he lived a life, and he never actually got to go home like Nehemiah took him home later. So he died there, but he died, and, and get this, he died living godly in an ungodly culture. But he made a difference, and he led and he didn't just lead, he led with excellence. But it started inside. May it start inside with us. Amen. May it start inside me, Lord. Remove any mediocrity. Any bit of it. Come on, let's pray together.